Hear ye, hear ye. Hear ye, dear viewer, and welcome. Welcome back to Moby Dick Abridged, or who cares what Eli thinks about Moby Dick? I, as ever, am your host, Eli, who cares what I think, and I'm ever so happy to have you here with me to discuss my favorite book, M Moby Dick. You, surely you guessed that, uh, didn't you, dear viewer? Of course you did. Who am I kidding? I should never have doubted you, dear viewer, and I never will again. And if I do, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, old chum. But for now, we return our attention from possible futures to the matter at hand. Chapter 6 of Moby Dick, The Street. It's another really short one, two or three pages really, depending on how you figure it. But it accomplishes a good deal in terms of storytelling. If you'll recall, we left Ishmael on Sunday morning after having arrived in New Bedford the night before and going through all the psychological turmoil of waiting to meet Queequeg, then finally meeting him and learning he's a great guy, uh, who Ishmael now trusts deeply. And they've just finished their breakfast and are heading out for a stroll. And with that, dear viewer, we will join them. This chapter opens with Ishmael saying that at first he was shocked to see someone like Queequeg in a setting like the one he finds himself in, in a foggy New England town in the time of, like, the Scarlet Letter, which incidentally was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne, who Herman Melville considered his best friend. So that is actually a pretty good frame of reference for what Ishmael might have been expecting. Anyway... At first, he was shocked, but his shock soon melted away after stepping out into the streets of New Bedford. He talks about how in practically any seaport of considerable size, you're likely to find some really weird shit and some really weird people doing it. Foreigners with strange clothes and strange languages, rough-looking motherfuckers who you don't want to look in the eye. You know what I mean. But in most places, these are just sailors. Not in New Bedford. In NB, you see straight-up cannibals chatting on the street corner. Smoking crack and drinking coffee. Talking about politics. Just a level beyond what you're likely to see in most places, you know? It's not all mean motherfuckers and shrunken heads and shit. There's also all kinds of weirdos from America, too. Vermonters and New Hampshiremen, Ishmael points out, all young and handsome and strapping and fresh from felling forests and seeking riches and glory in the fishery is their next adventures, and as green as the green mountains they come from. In some things, you'd think them but a few hours old, Ishmael says. And then he starts roasting the fuck out of the way some of them are dressed. He goes in on what he calls uh, bumpkin dandies, which are like fancy pants dudes who are really concerned with looking good, and they think they have style, but they're morons, and how they're worse even than like city-born dandies, which are bad enough. I'm guessing it probably landed more with the 1850s audience than it does with us, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, there's more, even, to New Bedford than sailors and whalers and cannibals and bumpkins, though. Even if you got rid of all that shit, New Bedford would still be a remarkable town, and that's because they've got oil. But not like they got in Texas. We're not talking about petroleum. We're talking about spermaceti. That's the substance that gives the sperm whale their name. You know, sperm, short for spermaceti. It's an oily, waxy substance that they have in vast quantities in their heads. And it's why they are so valuable that men are willing to risk their lives in combat with them. Spermaceti candles, from what I understand, were the best you could get. They burned brighter and longer than normal candles and were extraordinarily valuable in the pre-electrical age. Hmm. And so New Bedford is uh, balling, basically. They have opulent gardens and patrician houses and grand parks, and basically, they're about flaunting that whale money. In New Bedford, fathers, they say, give whales for dowers to their daughters and portion off their nieces a few porpoise apiece. You must go to New Bedford to see a brilliant wedding, for they say they have reservoirs of oil in every house, and every night recklessly burn their lengths in spermaceti candles. Kind of sounds like every night in New Bedford is like a party at the Great Gatsby's house or some shit. It's like Vegas or Monte Carlo or someplace that's almost 
like another planet. All this otherworldliness is reinforced by the fact that juxtaposed against all this opulent wealth and man-made beauty, the natural environment of New Bedford is incredibly harsh and unforgiving. The coast is a wave-beaten, barren collection of the rocks left over after God was finished with creation. I mean, just remember how destitute the black part of town was, where Ishmael was fumbling around in the dark before he found the spouter in. They weren't burning spermaceti candles in the windows over there. In any case... In the spring, Ishmael says, the horse chestnuts are like candelabras with their blooming blossoms, and in the summer, the maples line the streets with greens and golds. The terraces defy the landscape's barrenness with their brightly blooming flowers, and the women are more beautiful than roses, for roses only bloom in the summer. But the carnations of the new Bedford women's cheeks are perennial as sunlight in the seventh heavens. How lovely. Do you like jazz? I've, I've never actually seen B movie, which is strange, given that I'm such a big uh, Seinfeld fan. But it's got to be up there with Shrek, right? As far as memes, and I know that one. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna do a little freeform jazz with this part of the video, dear viewer. You may be familiar with the works of a guy named Joseph Campbell. He wrote books about mythology, and probably his most famous book is The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which explains his ideas about how all heroic stories are basically the same story, but with different names and shit, like a Mad Lib or something. The details might be different, but the structure, the skeleton of the story, is going to be the same. You may, dear viewer, even have heard of the hero's journey, which is what people use to refer to Campbell's ideas as a sort of shorthand. And the formula is evident in tons of really, really famous culturally significant media even today. Uh, Star Wars and Harry Potter, for example, follow the hero's journey pretty much to a T. Uh, I'm not really sure that Moby Dick does, though. Like, at all, really. I mean, there are certain elements of it uh, in there. And this chapter, so far at least, uh, in the book, has been the most dramatic, most noticeable uh, adherent to the formula. Uh, part of the hero's journey is called crossing the threshold, where the hero moves from the familiar world, which they've always known, into someplace unfamiliar, alien, oftentimes sinister, and inhospitable to them. Think of, like, leaving the Shire in Lord of the Rings, uh, Harry Potter going to Hogwarts, that's not exactly sinister and inhospitable, at least all the time, but it is like completely alien to him. Or Luke going to the cantina with Obi-Wan in Star Wars. Let's talk about Star Wars for a second. You remember, Luke Skyhorser, the young stallion, is an orphan with a secret past and a grand destiny. His mother was a queen and a senator in the Galactic Horse Senate, and his father is arguably the greatest user of the horse the Jedi Horster ever produced. But he doesn't know any of that shit. He's been raised by his Uncle Owen, whose name was basically unhorsable, unless I wanted to uh, just call him Uncle Horseman, which, believe me, I did. But alas, we must pace the bit a little bit, which is a horse pun. Get it? Bit? Anyway, he's been raised by his horse Uncle Owen, and uh, now he's come home to his stable, and he's stamping the sand out of his hooves, and he looks around and realizes that the barn's been burned down. You remember this scene. Somewhere in there, he ends up in Moss Horsley, the filthiest, scummiest, flea-bitteniest, infestediest, scum-infested, flea-bitten filth hole Obi-Wan horse nobody ever saw or whatever. You remember the line. And Horse Solo shoots that dude, and then the band... Uh, is playing that song that they play at the beginning of horse races, like at the Kentucky Derby. And that was the first ever hint of the multiverse that includes Star Wars and Seabiscuit. It's all there. And it's like nothing Luke's ever seen before. And that's sort of like what's going on in this walk Ishmael is taking. He's leaving behind what he's seen before, even when he was getting ready to go sailing in the past. This isn't like all those times. It's certainly not like any of the more prosaic parts of his life. Shit's about to be... All new. But horseplay aside. 
Hold for laughs. Big laugh. One of the ways I think, who cares what I think, by the way, uh, but, but I think uh, one of the ways Moby Dick deviates uh, from the typical hero's journey is that the characters kind of defy simple classification. We're used to the hero and the protagonist being the same person. We're used to that being the main character. We're used to the villain and the antagonist being the same person. But I don't think these things that we take for granted really apply to Moby Dick. Ishmael is the protagonist of the story in that he's the viewpoint character. He's the one narrating the story to us. So we get it colored with his brush, so to speak. But he's hardly a hero. Captain Ahab is like the main character, ultimately, if you ask me. His decisions are the axis around which the plot revolves. But he's more of a villain than a hero. Moby Dick himself is basically the antagonist of the story in that he's the object of the main character's hatred as well as the greatest single exterior threat to the crew of the Pequod. But how can an animal be a villain? I, I don't have an answer to that question, and the horse father is disturbingly silent despite my fervent prayers for clarity, so we'll have to leave it there. Please feel free to let me know what you think about all that shit in the comments. Uh, for now, though, dear viewer, I must wrap things up. We've covered chapter six, the street, and next time we will discuss chapter seven, the chapel. Until then, dear viewer, thank you for watching Moby Dick Abridged, or who cares what Eli thinks about Moby Dick. I, as always, have been Eli. Who cares what I think, and I hope you'll join me next time. Goodbye.